Welcome to John Gates Games. This is the variety vlog for January 2017, and as you can see, I have a bunch of different things I'll be covering in this video, so feel free to skip ahead to the section that most interests you, or stick around for the whole thing. Let's begin with a general update, and the Patreon campaign was really good last month. It was very strong. There were 12 new uh, patrons, eight of whom were new producer level pledges, so that's just really great to see. It was a big amount of increased support for the channel. Uh, next up, I finally bought a new microphone. I've been talking about getting a new mic for months and months, a couple times on this variety vlog. I finally bit the bullet and bought a Blue Yeti Pro, mostly because of the podcast that uh, Efka from No Pun Included and I have started doing. It's called Last Place if you haven't checked it out. It's just us talking about games. And I really wanted to have a better microphone to have just a better sound with that specific podcast. And I figured once I got it and I started playing around with it that I should probably see if I could integrate it into my videos as well. So I kind of uh, sneakily started doing this a couple weeks ago with uh, a couple uh, reviews back. I think uh, Terraforming Mars was the first one that I did it with. And uh, so far, nobody really commented that they don't see a lapel mic anymore. I'm no longer essentially wearing V-neck shirts. <laughs> I'm back to the regular t-shirt uh, because I have this microphone that's just dangling above my head right now. And I've been playing with a couple different um, uh, ways to uh, put the mic in different situations. And so far, I'm pretty happy with how it has panned out. If anything, it's just fun to have new tools and new things to play around with. Uh, when you don't really iterate or uh, innovate with the stuff you have, it's harder to uh, get better and learn new things. And I'm certainly learning some new things with this microphone. I've already made a couple of mistakes. I mean, with that Terraforming Mars video, the audio was definitely uh, lower than I wanted it to be. But the first class review was, uh, I think, a much better audio level. And once again, nobody has mentioned it yet, but I do have a new microphone, so that's a fun thing to play with. Let's now move into the next segment, which is your opinion. If you remember last month, I asked about how many times you thought that a game should be played by a reviewer before they sat down and actually did the reviews. I was thinking that three was in general good enough, and it seemed like there was some uh, amount of agreement there. Uh, many people thought that maybe four to five would be slightly better, but that three was somewhat of a minimum. And as I mentioned back then, I will super rarely only do two games before I do a review, but I will mention it in that review. Um, it's a little interesting putting the uh, number of uh, times I play the game into the reviews, especially with the way that I'm trying to film ahead. And I might have a situation where I film a review and then I actually play the game a couple more times and then publish it later on. But I guess that doesn't affect my opinion in that specific moment. And worst case scenario, I can always go back and try to uh, film a new segment if I think my opinion has changed in any way. So I think uh, let's move on to the uh, new question, which is actually really simple and a little bit selfish. But I would just like to know what your opinion is of the audio quality of this video and of the first class review that I just put out compared to the other videos that I've been doing for a couple of years now with that uh, lapel microphone. As far as I'm concerned, it seems like the quality is somewhat similar. Uh, it definitely feels different, and I would love to have the opinion of many other people, uh, whether or not they prefer this or maybe prefer me going back to the uh, lav mic because that might just be a fuller sound or something like that. So I love your opinion on that, and I think let's now move into the questions. I only received one this last month, and that came from RJ, and he asked, why do you do full playthroughs of some games and no review for them? And this is actually somewhat easy to answer because I have two different conditions for making these videos, essentially. With the reviews, I have to have played the game at least three times, as we just mentioned before, if not more, depending on the game. And with playthroughs, I don't have that kind of restriction if I don't say anything really subjective about in, in those specific videos. And that means that uh, I'm able to make full playthrough videos of games where that is the first play of that game. Uh, with uh, Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea that I put out last month, that was the first and only full play of the game that I did because actually after I filmed it, I put it in the mail and sent it off to another reviewer so that they could uh, cover that game as well. Uh, I always sit down and play a couple turns before I actually film it because I don't want to look like an idiot as I'm messing up rules. I want to know how I'm playing it, but it allows me to make some of my board game content without being restricted by pushing these games upon myself and my friends to get played, like with the reviews. It's really important for me to not be stuck to a schedule and really try to wedge in yet another play of this one game because I just need one more play before I get to three and then I can review it. And, you know, this is supposed to be fun uh, for me. It's becoming a little bit of a part-time job, but for all my friends, it's still just board games. So they don't want to be like, oh, we're going to go to John's place again. 
we're going to have to play what he says he wants to play because he's got to play it for the channel. And that's just not fun for me. So that means that the reviews usually come out somewhat later. I mean, I just put out Terraforming Mars Review, and that game has been out for many months now. Uh, and I've actually owned a copy for a couple months, but I wanted to wait until I got enough plays in to actually do it. Whereas I have other situations where if I'm really excited to get a game, a video made for a game, I could just sit down and just smack out a, a playthrough video of it, get it online, and I don't even have to worry about whether I played it enough times or have a subjective opinion. I could just put it out there as it is and then hopefully play it a bunch and in some cases get around to actually reviewing it later on. Let's now move into the Games of Note segment, and this is where I discuss the games that I played over this last month that are either new to me or were a particularly interesting play for some reason or another. I've sorted them from my uh, favorite plays down to least favorite. However, I enjoyed all of these. Um, all six of these were a good time, so I have nothing I'm really going to be trashing <laughs> over the course of this segment this month. Uh, so let's go ahead and begin with Warpgate, which is not actually a published game. In fact, it's it's not even that close. It's going to be doing a Kickstarter in September or something like that, and it's still being actively developed um, by the same designer and uh, publisher who put out Guards of Atlantis. And this one I just picked up over the last month. I haven't been able to try that one yet, but I was uh, chatting with Artum on uh, Twitter, and he asked me if I would be interested in giving his new game a shot. And I gotta say, I'm a bit of a sucker for um, for playtesting uh, games when I have the time for it. I tried to work that in. And also, I have a history of really enjoying 4X style games, and he said that this is a 4X style game that plays in 60 to 90 minutes. So I was very intrigued, because that's a bit of a holy grail, I think, in board gaming, trying to get that 4X experience, which is uh, explore, exploit, um, expand, and exterminate. Although, in my opinion, it really should be 5X, because experimentation is pretty much always a thing in these types of games, where you have research tracks or that kind of thing. But anyway, that's just a little rant that I have. Uh, so in his game, you are in space, and you are trying to expand out to different planets, and uh, fight um, your opponents to try and take control of these planets, and all these kind of typical tropey type things with this uh, sort of situation, but it has some really cool things going on. The first is a dice uh, action selection mechanic, which I've not seen before. So they have these custom dice with the uh, five different actions that you can do and then a wild action. Of course, all this could change because it's many months away from being published. But what you do is you roll these dice and then you activate them on this board, which also counts as kind of like your technology tree. And at the beginning of the game, you just have a 1x, 2x, 3x, and 4x um, showing up at the top, and you can't even get to that 4x spot. And you have to start from the, uh, the 1x and continue all the way, and you're going to activate three out of your five dice. And you'll do the activation as many times as the x on your board. So the first action you take in a turn will be a 1x, and it might be like, make a ship. So you just make a ship. The second time it comes around to you, it, it's the 2x spot, and now if you want to fly that ship somewhere, well, you can fly it one space times the number of X's you're at. So since you're at the 2X spot, you can fly two spaces. Or maybe you wait and fly that ship on the 3X because you want to go even farther across space on, in this game. And that's just such a neat idea. And the uh, next cool idea that they have is you fly around with this little science vessel that just stays out of all combat, and it goes from planet to planet. And when you go to these planets with the science vessel, you do some research, and you get to take a token off your player board, put it onto that planet, and you unlock a new spot on that board that you can now put a die on. And you can put any die onto any of the lower ones and activate a special ability. So what this means is if you roll poorly with your dice, you could use a die that you really don't care about to activate potentially a really cool special ability that will help you in that one given situation. So that's really cool already, both of these things. And another thing is I'm not usually crazy about dudes on a map style games where you're moving around trying to fight each other. But there's a really cool concept in this game where you just are always existing on the different planets in this uh, on this board. You're never like flying a set number of spaces across um, the expanse and then stopping. You just jump from one planet to the next, I guess, with warp gates. So you don't have to worry if you're like, oh, one hex to here or one hex over there. All you're worrying about is just leapfrogging from planet to planet, and you never actually occupy any of the space in between the planets. You just use that space to figure out how far you have to actually travel in one shot to get from one spot to the other. So that's really cool. And then he also has a combat um, mechanic that he's working pretty extensively on. It's changed quite a bit from the two times that it played it, so I'm not going to talk about it too much, but it's really quick and it allows you to do simultaneous reveals to just evaluate and see who wins a specific combat. 
And lastly, he's playing around with doing an objective mission-based style thing with the game where you are not only trying to expand out and uh, conquer these different sections of the galaxy, but you're also trying to do specific objectives that you're drawing into your hand uh, that you can then um, get victory points for. So it's not just about conquest. You might have uh, special things like, you know, fly from one ocean planet to another ocean planet or something like that. And again, all this could change before it actually hits Kickstarter in many months. But for the moment, I'm pretty excited about it. I, and I've enjoyed the conversation with him. He seems to really um, have his uh, head on his shoulders when it comes to uh, iterating and really trying all this stuff out with designs. I'm looking forward to playing this one more, although I'm not sure how many more times I'll test it because, well, I only have so much time and I really want to keep making these videos. But for now, I'm looking forward to seeing that one evolve and I think it's pretty likely that uh, when they end up doing a campaign for that one, I'll be trying to cover it with a video. So that's going to wrap up Warpgate. Uh, the second game that I want to talk about is The Climbers. And this was a bit of a grail game for me. I picked it up last month. I mentioned it in that variety vlog. It's been out for a bunch of years, like five, seven, eight years. Actually, it might have come out in 2008. Either way, it's a really old game and it looks pretty simple. You just have all these stacks of different colored blocks in the middle of the table and you're trying to climb on top of these blocks to get to the top and be at the top when the game ends. So I was able to uh, get two plays of this back to back and I really had a good time with it. It's a weird game where you just on every turn move one block and you can pick it up and kind of orient it uh, and have whatever color face you want facing up and then you can move your pawn and then anybody else can move their pawns on your turn as well if they have legal movement. And you can only move onto the faces that match your color or the wild color, which is gray. You also have these two really cool looking ladders, which unfortunately you only get to use them once per game and then you throw them out, which is a bit sad considering how cool they look. Um, uh, just the uh, component quality in this game is kind of odd. It comes in an orange shoebox. I mean, I can just show you right here. It's got, you know, a sleeve and then you just open up the top and it's just a bunch of different blocks in there. Anyway, we played it a couple times and I really enjoyed it. I was worried that after all this time and uh, ended up spending, I think, 60 bucks on this one, but I had been almost buying it for like 100 bucks for many times over the last couple years. I was worried that the hype had been built up too much in my head and that it would actually not be that interesting, but I really enjoyed both of our plays. I will say that the starting player won both of them and it seems like the starting player has a bit maybe of an advantage with tiebreakers as far as being as high as you can on the um, the mountain that you're creating. You're stacking up with all these blocks, but time will tell with this one. It does not play terribly long, and I'm looking forward to playing around with it more. The third game I'll be discussing is Bloodborne the Card Game. This is designed by Eric Lang, and it's set in, a, uh, in the IP of Bloodborne, which is a really popular video game that I have pretty much no experience with. <laughs> All I can say is it's a very dark, twisted, fantasy, medieval style setting. Actually, I think this one might be more steampunky, uh, but either way, there are twisted, disgusting monsters that you are trying to fight throughout the game, and that's really all that's going on. Everybody's collectively beating down these monsters, and then these mini-bosses, and then finally a final boss at the end of the game. But this is a strictly competitive game. You are fighting these monsters together, but you are definitely kind of fighting amongst each other, trying to get the upper hand at all times, because well, it's the person with the most points at the end of the game who's going to win, and there's lots of different ways you can mess with your opponents. So the way it works is at the beginning of a round, you flip over what the monster is going to be, and it might have a special ability or it might just tell you how hard it's going to be attacking you. And then everybody simultaneously picks out a uh, item from their hand of cards, puts it face down, and then you all reveal. After that, you will then do some maybe inst instant effects, and then everybody's going to do damage to the monster based on the amount of damage that the specific weapon that they picked does. And turn order can really matter here, because if you uh, take the last uh, life points off of a monster before somebody else has a turn, well, they're not going to be able to get th those points, and uh, those are the victory points for the game. However, there is a push-your-luck aspect here, because... Well, after everyone damages the monster, actually technically before that, the monster is going to roll a die and attack everybody around the table universally. And they have the ability to just kind of explode and keep rolling the die almost infinitely. So on any turn of the game, you have the possibility of just losing all your life and dying. And if you have any of these, um, they call them blood points in the game, but the, the damage that you've done to monsters, if you haven't banked at those before you die, you lose them. So just because you did that damage to a monster does not mean you're going to have it at the end of the game. You need to kind of do a rest turn um, in order to push all that down into your area. And even then, you have to hope that you don't die. You can take half damage on that rest turn, but it's still possible that it could go really poorly and you lose all of those things. So the interesting part of that about this game is it has a hand-building vibe to it because you don't really have a deck. You play a card and it stays out in front of you and you keep playing them until you do that reset which pulls all your cards back into your hand. 
You're not allowed to have more than seven cards in your hand. And so pretty quickly, you are going to be drawing new cards from the central tableau and then needing to discard them from your hand uh, to kind of keep modifying this set of actions and weapons and stuff that you have available to you. And this is probably the strongest part of the game. I enjoyed kind of cultivating the weapons that I had based off of the weapons that my opponents have because some weapons can do bad things to the opponents. If, you know, I play this one thing and they play a ranged weapon, then I get to steal some of their points and that kind of thing. I also just liked the variety of those different skills that we were grabbing. It did seem like it was a little weird that we have these endgame bosses that you hit, that you fight at the end, and they have a universal effect that affects the entire game. So the one that we played, everybody had two less health for the entire game. And that's kind of neat. It gives you some replayability so that next time you sit down, maybe the next thing is that the boss regens, or I don't know, something. There's, there's a whole bunch of different uh, abilities that the, this variety of final bosses give to you. But the weird thing is, the final boss, when you actually go to fight them, has no special abilities. So we actually had a situation where we had a mini boss right before the final boss, and the mini boss had more health than the final boss, and had a more interesting effect than the final boss. So it almost seemed a little bit um, anticlimactic when we got to the final boss of the game and we went ahead and beat it down. And it just felt like it was less interesting than it could be. It didn't have an epic feel to being a final boss. I feel like it should have a global effect on the game, which is really cool. That increases replayability. But then the final boss should also have some sort of interesting, mean, or terrible effect that you have to deal with that makes that fight different from every single other fight in the game. And yeah, like I said, it's a little weird that some of the mini-bosses were had more interesting effects than the actual final boss. But either way, we had a good time of it. We played a three-player game. It seemed like it was going really fast until we had a couple bosses that took many rounds to kill. I think it was definitely over an hour, like maybe even close to an hour and a half, but I can't be totally positive on that. It was a neat experience, and I would totally sit down and play this one again, although I don't think it's necessarily one I'm going to look out to go and grab. Next up, we have Joking Hazard, which is a new game along the lines of Apples to Apples and Cards Against Humanity, where you it have it's a party style game where everybody has a hand of cards. One person is the judge, everybody else plays a card, and then the judge figures out who did the funniest thing. So the main way that this one works is that you are trying to build a comic strip because this is created by the people who make the Cyanide and Happiness uh, webcomic online, and it's a pretty neat twist on this old on this style of game because. What happens is the judge, they reveal one card into the middle of the table, and unlike every other of these types of games that I've played, the judge now actually has a decision to make. They have to play a card from their hand as well, and they put it uh, to the front or behind the random card they just pulled, effectively building the first two panels of a three-panel comic strip. And then after they do that, then everybody around the table picks one card from their hand that will go in the third panel, and then you shuffle them up, reveal them, and the judge decides who did made the funniest or most interesting comic available based off of the cards that they had. And this is a really neat tweak because it means that the person judging is actually a part of the... Um, the ability to make something funny. Like sometimes it's just not that funny and it's actually the judge's fault because the card they put down didn't really work that well with the first card that came out. And you might just be kind of backed into a corner. You don't have good cards in your hand, but I really enjoyed this one. I played it twice and I mean, I was not really interested in playing Cards Against Humanity anymore anyway because I feel like it gets really stale and the jokes are overly offensive for offensiveness' sake. Whereas this game feels like it has a lot more room for creativity of um, joke making. I will admit there's still some gory cards, there's still lots of juvenile cards in here, but they are nowhere near as, in general, on average, as in your face and just blisteringly terrible and awful for being awful sake as Cards Against Humanity is, for, uh, for instance. So I enjoyed uh, playing this one. It was a pretty neat experience. We had quite a few laughs, and there was a reasonable amount of thinking involved looking at your hand, trying to figure out how you could make this make any sense. And, you know, sometimes you just throw a random card in because you just don't have anything that works. That just happens with the style of game. But I was significantly impressed with this game. I went into it with pretty low expectations because I'm not a fan of this style of game in general, and I had a good time both times I played it. The fifth game I'll be talking about is Factory Fun, which is definitely not a new game. This came out in 2006, which makes it 11 years old at this point. And technically, this is my second play of the game. This was a four-player game, and I had a pretty good time with it. But the first time I played it was two players, and I was not that big a fan. And the reason for that is because the way this game works is you are every single round flipping over a tile with all of your opponents, and then it's a race where you need to figure out which tile is going to be best for you and grab it before anybody else does, and then you are committed to putting that tile down into your area or throwing it out and losing some points. And in a two-player game, that just meant that there really there's just two options, so I wasn't that compelled 
enough to even talk about it in the vlog when I ended up playing it uh, several months ago, probably like five or six months ago. So this time I played it as a four-player game and I had a much more fun with it this time. I Before, my opinion of it was I didn't really like it. In fact, I kind of had to be convinced to try this four-player game of it. And we had a pretty good time because what you're doing with these tiles is essentially turning colored stuff into different colored stuff in a crazy chain. <laughs> you start with these little wells of infinite pink or infinite blue, and then you'll take a tile that you maybe put it down that requires pink, and it then will output a little bit of blue and maybe a little bit of green. And then on the next turn, maybe you take a tile that needs an input of green, and you could stick that on the output of the previous tile, and then that new one will output to orange or something like that. And this is a surprisingly punishing game <laughs> because it's very easy to grab the wrong tile and then look down and realize there's really you thought it was good, but there's nowhere to really put it well for you. Or you might put a tile down and put a bunch of connector tiles down and then a turn or two later realize you really messed yourself over. And now you need to spend an incredible amount of money kind of ripping things out and putting it back in. It's a interesting experience. I would definitely play it again. I enjoyed it quite a bit at the four player setting and it was pretty quick. It was probably like 40 or so minutes long. So it did not sit around long. You just do 10 of these flips. I think it was 10. Anyway, I think it was about 10 turns in the whole game, just taking a tile, putting it down and making it work with what you have. It's a very simple setting and I had a good time with it. So yeah, I, um, a friend of mine owns it uh, in my uh, gaming group, so I could totally see myself playing it again because it is such a relatively short game to play and it had some neat decisions even though I'm not crazy about the real-time uh, mechanism of drawing those tiles and I probably never will be crazy about it, although in uh, the game's defense, I think that it is probably necessary to create that tension of grabbing the wrong piece and then suffering through the consequences of it. And finally, we have game number six, which is Mr. Jack, which is also quite old and also not the first time I played it. This is the second play of the game, and it's a two-player asymmetric style game where one person plays Jack the Ripper trying to escape, and the other person plays the police trying to catch them before time runs out. Uh, so we played this game, Jessica and I played this game about a year ago or so. She bought it at a live board game auction. Actually, we might have had it for a couple years now. Either way, we got one play in a long time ago and both thought it was okay. And we decided to give it another shot um, a couple weeks ago to see if we wanted to keep it in our collection or not. Um, you know, we're starting to run out of space over here on the wall. And uh, we just refreshed ourselves by going ahead and sitting down to play it. Jessica played Jack and I played the police trying to catch her. And it's, I think, an eight round game. And if you go all eight rounds without catching Mr. Jack, then the police lose. And I was doing really well. It was like the fourth round and I narrowed it down to like two people. And I really thought I had her on the ropes because the way you actually play the game is each turn, one person plays one out of four different um, actions. The other person plays two from the remaining three. And then the comes back to the first person who plays that final card. So there are eight actions total and you pull four out and then four out in the even and on turns. So it's a very interesting thing. When you take the first card, you have all these options, but you know that the other person's going to do two actions in a row, which can be huge. And uh, the uh, the reversal is that when you take those um, when you take those two cards in the middle, you are you have a great amount of restriction that you're able to employ upon the other person by just allowing them to have one single card left. But you do not have first dibs at getting that first card. So anyway, I thought I was doing really well. I was figuring out where she was, and I thought I had it all set and done. And then I think it was like the fourth turn, she played a card and said, nope, this is Jack. And she just ran out of the city <laughs> and I lost it. I was like, whoa, that was surprisingly fast. Um, and I was essentially hedging my bets. And I did a coin flip a turn earlier to figure out, um, well, not to figure out. I essentially said, I think it's this or this. And I think it's slightly more likely to be the uh, green lady. Uh, so I played around that to make sure if she was the green lady, she would not be able to escape. Um, and unfortunately, it turns out she was the police constable guy. And uh, so she ended up winning. And we decided that we had a pretty good time with it. We're still actually not sure if we're going to be keeping it or not, because it was a, a neat experience. Um, but there's something about it that's both interesting and at the same time, not incredibly exciting for us. I, I, the deduction is somewhat neat, but it's uh, very thinky. And I guess it's also a very quiet game. Uh, for a couples game, we're both pretty much just sitting there not talking and thinking a whole bunch, which might be a little bit of a detractor for it um, as we're thinking about it. So for now, it's still sticking around and I'm glad we got to play it. And I'm a little bit bummed that I lost so fast.
Let's now go into the shifting shelf, which is where I show you the new games that have been put onto my shelf. And I also show you the games I had to pull off and hypothetically it will be getting rid of uh, in order to make room for it because I really do need to try and keep my collection on this shelf here. So I have a bit of a board game purgatory downstairs underneath our bed where the, all the games that I'm going to be selling at the next uh, live auction or the next um, uh, flea market will be stored. So uh, for this month, I only picked up, let's see here, uh, five games, although I guess only four games because one of them, uh, Seven Wonders Duel Pantheon, is an expansion. Unfortunately, we have not been able to get that one played yet, but um, I bought Jessica a copy of Doggy Go because we had such a good time with that at Board Game GeekCon. And then my Kickstarter for Ave Roma finally came in. Haven't had a chance to play that one yet. Uh, Guards against uh, Guards of Atlantis uh, is a review copy that was sent over to me. Uh, I guess it's kind of like a, a two-on-two team-based game where you're trying to fight all these uh, little minions and your opponent's pieces. I've heard really good things about it. Efka from No Pun Included really liked it, so I'm looking forward to giving that one a shot. And then I also picked up Blood of an Englishman, which is a two-player asymmetric card game. Uh, I haven't got to play that one yet. It's by the same uh, person who designed uh, Arboretum, and I really liked Arboretum, so that's the main reason I decided to grab that one. Uh, so when it comes to the games that I had to pull off, the first one was Rialto, and man, this one really pained me because this is a Stefan Feld game that came out a bunch of years ago, and I've had it pretty much since it first came out. And it has such a cool mechanism where you actually deal out hands of cards face up on the table, uh, one more than the number of players, and then you actually choose which hand of cards you want to take, and then the rest of the game is you actually playing these cards and maybe doing a little bl bit of bluffing and figuring out what people are going to hold from hand to hand. And I just loved this mechanism of the face-up hands. Like, it's not just deal out hands of cards and play the cards you get. You, you pick them. But unfortunately, the other side of the game was a lot of area majority in these different city areas. And the order in which you evaluate them is, you know, somewhat obtuse and... There was some engine building with some buildings you could get. It was it was really unfortunate. It was essentially a really awesome um, hand um, choosing mechanic w wrapped in with a bunch of somewhat average Euro-y type mechanics. And I enjoyed this one more than everyone else I played it with. And it got to the point where I just can never get it played with any of my friends. And I don't really like the area control part of it that much anyway. So I decided to pull that one down. Uh, next up is Nippon, which honestly, I'm just trying to make space on my shelf. I think Nippon is a really great game, and one of my best friends really likes the game, and so I pretty much just offered it to him. I said, hey, do you want to now own Nippon so that it's still in our gaming group? I could still play it, but it's not on my shelf, it's on his, and he said yes, because I think he also likes the game more than I do. It's a really neat game. I'm worried about the variability from one play to the next, um, but I've enjoyed it every single time i played. And the last one is Tuluva. Oh man, this one finally made the cut, or finally didn't make the cut, I suppose. I've had this one forever. This was the first board game that I ever reviewed for this channel. I've played it like 35 plus times. It was a Christmas present, I think back in 2009 or 10 for me, back when I was really first getting into board games. And it is a super beat up box because I took it with me everywhere for months and months and months when I first had the game. It's an abstract style game where you're putting down these tiles and trying to build these villages. I used to love it. It used to be my favorite game if you'd asked me what my favorite game was. And now I just, I'm not that interested in playing it anymore. I feel like I really squeezed all the blood from that stone that I could possibly get. And I just don't play abstract style games that much anymore. It just seems like it's not compelling enough. And I think it's time to move on and accept the fact that I'm really probably not going to be playing this one anymore. So I should pull it off the shelf, make room for something new. And with that, we've reached the end of this vlog. I hope you've enjoyed all the stuff that I've covered. Uh, once again, feel free to uh, leave some comments down below if you have anything to say about the relative audio quality of this video versus the last. And also, if you're looking for new podcasts to listen to, we've now put out, I think, four episodes uh, to Last Place, which is just a conversational style podcast between Efka and myself. And uh, we've really enjoyed making it so far. And there's been a pretty good positive reception to it so far. So feel free to check that out wherever your podcasts are sold. <laughs> you can also find them on YouTube. Uh, YouTube, but currently they're being posted on the No Pun Included channel. So yeah, I think that's pretty much everything I have to say. I'd like to once again thank everybody who has been supporting this channel directly through Patreon, uh, including all of these producer level pledges. If you too would like to directly support the channel, you could do so at patreon.com slash games, and I'd really appreciate it. Also, if you'd like to see more of these monthly variety vlogs, as well as full game playthroughs and uh, in-depth board game reviews, please subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.